morning again. So uh, kids are dismissed for kids under construction. Uh, they can head on upstairs. And uh, let's see here. Are we switched over? Okay. So I'm, I'm looking at the clock and, oh, you fixed it. I was going to say, I only had like five minutes. It was going to be a funny joke and now you, you fixed it. So, okay. You're all thinking, yeah, right. So I can't even read a verse in five minutes. I can't even get to my slides in five minutes. I don't know. So I, I, I literally start out with my, my passage this morning. I have no banter before it. So, um, so we'll see what, what happened. The computer ate my sermon. I might have to actually make you guys open up Bibles. I don't know. Oh, there it is. Yay. All right. So this morning we're going to be looking at the parable of the two debtors. It's found in uh, Luke 7, verses 41 through 42. Um, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will he love more? This is really a nice and short parable, isn't it? I mean, obviously this is going to be a super easy sermon, barely an inconvenience. Well, not really. See, because we have to actually ask something else here. What is Jesus asking here, and who is he asking? If you remember when we started the parables, I told you that the audience matters. And so understanding who Jesus is talking to, and also, just a little spoiler towards the end, Luke is going to include you in this parable. He wants the reader to also respond to something. So this is one of those moments that Jesus gives a parable that actually requires a response. He wants a judgment call to be made, right? Instead of where sometimes we see the parables being an answer to a question, it's Jesus now asking the question here. So what we should be asking is what's the context? What are the circumstances? And I'm glad you're asking that because that's where we're going this morning. So backing up, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. So note who's in the audience here. There's a Pharisee. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. I should say at the table, shouldn't it? Uh, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought in alabaster flask of uh, ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. So what are, what's our setting here? It's Simon the Pharisee. It's his house, right? They are reclined at his table which, by the way, when we talk about reclining at a table, I don't know about you, I think of reclining as a relaxed position, but here it's actually a sign of a formal, formal meal. It's not casual. Um, what we will learn in later part of this passage that we haven't gotten to, there is indeed a fuller audience, and so the point of this meal then is, uh, well, it's, it's, there's something to be discussed. There's going to be some sort of discourse. And that's what that reclined at the table means. It's a formal setting. You have a guest of honor, if you will, and there's a reason for this. But right now, up to this point, I want you to notice how everything revolves around Simon. His house, what he has said to himself, and the fact that Jesus is addressing him alone. We could speculate for a moment here, why did Simon invite Jesus in the first place? Now, the bigger picture is that he obviously wants to engage Jesus firsthand, right? But it's interesting because in this process of the things that happen, the events that happen, he comes to this conclusion that Jesus is neither a righteous person nor a prophet, which I would suggest would be to say he already had that in his head. He was looking for a reason to say it, and now he recognizes it. He's like, this this man can't be. He, if this man were a prophet, meaning he's not, if he would have known, right, who he's touching. So he's recognizing this man isn't anything special. 
that starts to imply, Luke is letting us in, the intention of what this meal was about. I would contrast this to the time that Nicodemus engages with Jesus because here Simon has invited Jesus to come to his house. Who has home field advantage at this moment? Well, that's Simon. But Nicodemus, albeit in the dark, in the evening, Nicodemus goes to Jesus. There's a difference in what they're seeking. Simon wants to establish what he already believes. Nicodemus is searching for answers. Then we have this unplanned event that leads to Jesus ultimately giving us this parable. There's a lot of other things I think that we need to take note in order to grab a hold of exactly what's going on here and everything else that's happening. The other Gospels have similar stories. I'm sorry, I forgot to silence my phone up here as my timer's going off. That's supposed to keep me on track. It doesn't. Um, the, other, uh, the other Gospels have similar stories to what's happening here uh, in terms of uh, somebody anointing Jesus' feet, a woman in particular. And so a question we have to start asking if, we can, if we're trying to understand the fuller context is, is this the same event as those other events or are, you know, it's just being told differently? Because this is the only place this parable comes into play. It doesn't, it's not in any of the other Gospels. Or is it just a matter of, well, this is a similar event. This sort of thing happens to Jesus. For some reason, people just feel they need to put stuff on Jesus' feet, right? Now, most will conclude, most scholars will conclude that this is an isolated event which resembles different events. Now, one of those other events, and there's a reason why I'm going here, so just track with me. One of the other events that we have that's very, very similar to this is concerning Mary, sister of Martha and, La you know, and Lazarus, right? And she anoints the feet of Jesus. But it's important to understand that this woman and this event and the story of Mary, we have two different towns that this is taking place. We have two different houses because that took place in Mary and Martha's house. And so this story here, though, is talking about a woman who is unknown. And that's actually Luke playing with words here because while it's identified as an unknown woman, it's very clear Jesus knows who this woman is because he's Jesus. But it's pretty clear that Simon knows who this woman is. He makes the assertion at least. So why does Luke say she's an unknown woman? What's well, actually happening here? That's something that's important. Hold on to that. It's important, though, that when we look at this story, okay, that we stick to the details that are given and not add things that aren't there. Because when we start adding things, that's where we make the story about something that it's not. So in most cases, when we hear about the story about the woman who comes in, she's crying, the, the feet and the perfume and all of those things, She's usually identified as something. She's usually identified as a prostitute. But I would ask you really quickly here, at what point in time did you hear the word prostitute as I was reading the scripture this morning? You didn't, and there's a reason. She's not. Not that we know of. Now, where do we get this idea from? Well, part of it is that uh, um, we, we seem to apply that title. For whatever reason, it seems to be anytime we have a single woman who happens to be of wealth, we immediately associate her with a prostitute. Example, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala. Mary Magdalene is historically known as a prostitute, but yet nowhere in the scripture is she ever identified as a prostitute. Not once. There's nothing that even implies it. Where do we get such an idea that this woman is a prostitute and Mary Magdalene is a prostitute? Well, we get this idea going back to a sermon that was given in 590 by Pope Gregory the Great. Pope Gregory the Great declared not only was Mary a prostitute, but she is indeed the unknown woman found in Luke 7. Now, one of the parts that we know of Mary is that Mary had, uh, she was possessed by seven spirits, to which his sermon implied that she was not literally possessed, because during that particular time, the Catholic Church disavowed possession. So they were allegorically seven vices that she had, and that she was delivered from her seven vices, including, amongst that list, sexual immorality. 
The sermon went further to say that Mary of Magdala is also Mary of Bethany. That the transition is that she moved as a sinful woman from here to a saved woman there. So now, in one sermon, he has not only declared this woman is a prostitute, but this woman is Mary of Magdala, who is also Mary, sister of Lazarus from Bethany. And this one person was a prostitute. And I would ask, where in the Scripture have we ever heard the word prostitute with any of these three different women? We don't. And the whole entire conclusion is this. Well, because in this passage, there's an anointing of feet, and Mary of Bethany anoints with feet. And since Mary of Magdala is obviously a prostitute, please note the sarcasm, they all must be one and the same. He even went further, if you could go further. Remember that event where there was a woman who was about to be stoned for adultery and Jesus got in the middle of all that? That's her too. In fact, that's why she's so grateful and that's why she has come to this place at this time because he stopped that event happening. By the way, if you just would bother to read the timeline of the Gospels, you would see none of this can line up at all. See, this is what happens when we don't consider the full context of the entirety of the Gospels And we make wild accusations based on ignorance of the Scripture. And yes, Pope Gregory the Great was ignorant when it came to the Scriptures. This is improper exegete, how it always gives way to eisegete. Exegete is when we take the Word and we understand what the Word says. And we understand the context because of what the Word says. Eisegete is when I want to make my point and I make the Word make my point. Or I use the Word to make my point. So what does the context say here? What is important and how does it actually lead to this parable, thus telling us what the parable's intention is? So we go back to the settings. At the beginning of it, it's a meal. There's a meal happening. The other word that could be translated here is banquet, which again gives us that sense of formalness. This is not just lunch with Jesus after church, okay? There's something greater happening here. And it says that they're reclining at the table. And I want to give you a picture of what that looks like. We don't have any photographs. I can't advance. Brandon, sorry. There we go. So this is what reclining at the table is. And I'm just going to tell you real quick here, if you ever invite me over for a meal and this is how we're sitting, I'm probably leaving. Um, I, this is the most uncomfortable looking thing. I, why, there are beds next to the the, I don't know, some of you are thinking, yes, uh, but I just couldn't do this, especially, you know, I just, anyhow, and by the way, my, uh, everybody's great, 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 great grandma, right, somewhere along the line convinced us that putting the elbows on the table is a very bad thing. I'm just going to say, what would Jesus do? Um, it's right there. So, Nonetheless, we have this banquet. There's a contrasting event that just happens just before this dinner with this Pharisee. There's a different dinner. Jesus goes to a lot of dinners. I'm, I'm stuck again, Brandon. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Luke 5. After this, he, Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. You know this guy by another name. Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast, banquet, right, in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table uh, with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So we have this situation with Matthew, and in the process, the question being asked by the uh, Pharisees, the very same Pharisee group that we would see in the couple chapters later here, why do you eat with them? But I want you to notice, who do the Pharisees ask this question to? They ask the disciples. There's an implication there. They don't ask Jesus. Maybe it was because Jesus was a little occupied. Maybe it's because the Pharisees were... I I don't know how this all worked. I don't know if the Pharisees were actually at the meal or if they were looking through a window and leaning in. I'm not sure how the awkwardness of it... All I know is this. They asked the disciples, why? Because they're trying to stir something up. Because that's how you do it. See, when you're pretty self-righteous and you're pretty sure of yourself, you don't go straight to the source. You kind of undermine. You go find the weaker 
And that's what a disciple is compared to a teacher. He's the weaker one. He's not the fully educated one. Maybe they have an answer. Maybe they don't. Maybe he can catch them off guard. But I want you to notice who answers the question. Jesus. That's interesting. Jesus wasn't asked, and yet Jesus answers. And I want you to pay attention to the answer. He's asking, who really needs me? Right? Because the idea would be, apparently, you don't. Right? The religious teachers. You don't need me. You don't understand what's going on here. There's somebody who needs repentance, and there's somebody who doesn't. The righteous person doesn't need repentance. The sinner does need repentance. And I would think about what the scripture says. First off, how many righteous people walk the earth? (laughs) Not one. So when he says that, who doesn't need him? Apparently everybody needs him. It's those who admit that they're a sinner, and that's something that we have to hold on to here because I'm not sure if you're ready for this, but if you're not aware, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Now, our degree of sin might be different, but at the end of the day, we are all sinners. So why did Jesus come? He came so that sinners would what? Repent, turn away from their sin. A righteous person has nothing to turn away from is what he's saying. This sets up our bigger story because you have to take a look at the response that happens. Now, speaking of which, I want you to notice what Matthew has done here, right? Matthew is invited to follow Jesus, and Matthew's response, Levi, his response is what? He invites Jesus and the disciples over for dinner. He throws a big party, great feast. He wants to show his gratitude, and he wants to take Jesus, and you notice the audience here, he takes him and he wants to bring Jesus into his world, right? He's not going to isolate. He's not going to say, well, this isn't for you. He wants Jesus in there. In fact, I would suggest that this is one of the first proper acts of evangelism that we see in the New Testament. It's literally Matthew turning to him and saying, I want you to come and meet my friends. And just as, if not more importantly at this moment, I want them to meet you. And this is going to happen, well, it's going to happen in a meal, A casual setting, great party, a place where conversation can happen, where you can put your elbows on the table and listen to what's being said. But when we get to this other story, this other meal, it's almost framed like it's an interrogation at this point in time. We're going to investigate who Jesus is, not let everybody in on who Jesus is. And so while they're reclined at the table, we have this interruption. Quite the move to simply just enter into somebody else's house, right? But that's the enthusiasm that's taking place here. And what happens next is just simply a series of wrongs. There's nothing right about what's about to take place next. She brings perfume and anoints. And yet, you don't anoint with perfume. You anoint with oil, but she's bringing perfume. And by the way, the picture of the alabaster container, the, the idea there is that whatever you first put in an alabaster container, that's all you can ever put in it because it will absorb what's there. So it is perfume. That's what ointment means, by the way, here. It's not oil. It's definitely not the oil that one would anoint somebody with. You don't anoint with perfume. She then turns around and uses it on his feet. You don't anoint feet you anoint the head. All I can think of at this particular moment, there, I, I think there's an allusion here. Allusion, not illusion. To Isaiah 52.7. See, Isaiah 52.7 reminds us how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And this is the place that she goes to, is his feet. And I'm not saying that's exactly what Luke is saying, but all I can think about is her her, as we're about to see, her gratitude towards Jesus, and it's demonstrated in the one who brings the good news. That's what he came for. The next thing that's wrong is she lets her hair down. It's a big, big no-no, right? Uh, and I'm looking over at the McCombers, and I'm saying, I only see one girl in the right, okay? So there it is. Um, all the rest of you, we'll pray. Um, but no, she lets her hair down, Now, there's only two acceptable moments that you can let your hair down in this kind of a setting. One is in an act of deep grieving, and the other is an act of deep worship. And it's interesting because they're both very similar why it's okay for the hair to come down, because the idea would be the hair becomes the veil. You cover your face with it, right? Again, yeah, Elizabeth can demonstrate that, so... 
But those are the times that that can happen, is in this deep grieving and this deep worship, which could be one and the same in some cases. I would also remind you, when we use the word worship, not everybody understands the word worship the same. Worship, worship is not exclusive to God, is it? It should be, but we worship a lot of things. So you could be asking the question, what exactly is her, because this is an act of worship that she's doing now. What is she worshiping? How is she worshiping? Because she's doing it in all the wrong ways. She then kisses his feet. Now, that one's just weird. I don't have anything to say on that one. She's like, that's it's, it's gross. Um, I, you know, it, but yet, we'll see that there is a, a proper way to kiss in this scenario. And again, the feet's not the right place. Now, we also see this picture that she's cleaning his feet with her tears. She then dresses them with the perfume, a very costly perfume. So you could, I, I keep saying everything here is wrong, and you could ask, well, what exactly is so wrong with this? Well, it kind of goes back to this presumption of her being a prostitute. And by the way, I want to make sure you understand, I don't know if she was or wasn't, and I don't think that's the point of the Scripture, to know whether she was or wasn't. But one of the leaps, one of the reasons why we might come to this conclusion is because of how we understand the temple prostitutes when it came to Roman worship. And the things that she is doing are pictures of what the temple prostitutes might have done in certain moments in Roman worship. In that case, what we're talking about is a woman subjecting herself in almost a humiliating fashion before a man, the picture of subservience and dominance. Now, when we read throughout uh, the Scripture in particular, uh, Paul brings it up, and we will see uh, the prosti temple prostitution both happens with uh, male and female. It's always a man going into and practicing this worship with either another female or another man. But it's always a picture of dominance. The person who's coming in, they are the dominating one. And here, what's being done it's not really being done in a godly way. All of these things are series of wrongs. Honestly, anybody else would have stepped back and they would have seen this. I'm going to use some words that aren't exactly churchy words here for a moment, but you need to understand the gravity. They could be seen as something that is erotic, obscene, or even pornographic. So what makes a difference? Why is it that Jesus doesn't stop her if that's the case? Well, the details that Luke gives us, the one detail that sets it all apart, her tears. That's not part of all those other things. That means that she is worshiping in a way that she knows how to worship, but at the same time, there is something else that's happening here, and we can't overlook it. Her act is a, not an act of humility, but a true humility. It's a true graciousness, and it is a true thanksgiving. This is the act of someone who has already received grace, and is now acting on it, acting because of it. So look at what Simon does in response, though. Right? He thinks to himself. He says to himself. That's meaning that, that those words weren't uttered out loud. It's not verbalized. And yet, Jesus responds. It's amazing how many times people think things or they say things off to the side, and then we see Jesus respond. And I have to stop, and I really do wonder for just a moment, how exactly does, after this whole event, how does Simon see him? Because he says he's not a prophet, and yet clearly if he can read the mind of, I think at minimum it puts Jesus into that prophet status, right? But it's here now that we get this, this parable when Jesus says, a certain money lender, and he talks about that, he says, which of them will love him more? Verse 43, Simon answered, because that's, it's a question, it demands an answer, the one, I suppose, from whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. You get a gold star. Jesus requires Simon to respond. Now, what makes this moment rather humorous is because back in verse 40, right, Jesus says, I have something to say. And Simon says, say it. Simon doesn't know at that moment, Jesus <laughs> knows what Simon's thinking. So when he says, I have something to tell you, it's in response to what Simon's thinking. Simon's not ready for this. It's a dangerous thing to say, okay, Jesus, what do you got? Because Jesus is going to let it out. The parable gives us two men in debt. Both are equally forgiven. 
There's two different amounts, okay? So let's do the math real quick. A denarii is a day's wage. So you got one guy who's approximately a year and a half uh, worth of wages that have been dismissed, and the other guy about two months. I'm going to tell you real quick here. The amount, not important. That is not the key of the verse. The key of the verse is who did this act, this act of forgiveness, who did it actually cost? Well, it cost the money lender in the parable. For the sake of the meaning of the parable, who's the money lender? It's God, right? God's the money lender in this scenario. Uh, Kyle Snodgrass says this, God is like a money lender who does not care about the money, right? And, and so you stop and even think about the contrast of these two different banquets. I mean, he just had a banquet with a group of people that literally it's always about the money. They're the tax collectors. And here it's about the Pharisees. And apparently with the Pharisees' mindset, maybe it's all about the money as well. There's a point that's being made here. And I want, this is one of these important things as we approach the parables. And I'm going to say something that some people are going to be like, huh, just track with me. The parables are not perfect theology. You don't take the parable, which is in a, uh, a poetic or a common kind of way, an illustration, and say, ah, that's the theology. For instance, God is not a moneylender. The perfect theology would be to say God's a moneylender, apparently, because that's who God is. He's the moneylender. God is not a moneylender. Stop treating God like an ATM or any kind of bank. This is not specifically about the debt, and it's not about the amount of debt. It's the very act of both the forgiveness of the debt and the one who receives the forgiveness. That's the point. In fact, Luke's theme through his entire gospel, every gospel writer has a theme that's traced all through it. Luke's theme is forgiveness and how it pertains to being released from debt. Debt is also known as sin. So that's the theme all through Luke's gospel. You cannot read Luke's gospel and not understand forgiveness. If you don't come at the end of Luke's gospel in particular, and you are not a master of what it means to forgive and be forgiven, you haven't read the gospel. The question here isn't who should be forgiven. Right? He doesn't say, which one should be forgiven? The guy with the most debt or the little debt? Or which one has, has a, a greater need of forgiveness? Or any of those things. Really, it's this. Which of these should be more grateful? Which of those two do you suppose would act out more towards this forgiveness? Both are being forgiven. Both are being forgiven equally. But which one do you think is going to appreciate it more? Right? And obviously the answer is both. But literally, Jesus is saying, but just pick one. Which one? There's another parable in Matthew where we see a man who's forgiven an incredible debt that makes the one and a half year debt look pretty small. And yet, when he's forgiven of that, he turns around and there's somebody else who owes him a significantly smaller debt and he himself doesn't forgive that person. Which would then question, did he understand the forgiveness he had received in the first place? That's the point of that. In fact, maybe that parable in Matthew is, the, shall we say, it's the sequel to this parable. I kind of wonder if Simon, the Pharisee, ever heard it. By the way, real quick here, just so we're making sure, because again, with the whole confusion of the Marys, um, Peter heard that message, and you'll remember Peter's also name was Simon. Simon the Pharisee is not Peter. I, I'm really hoping most of you are like, well, duh. I read several articles that tried to imply the same thing. By the way, one of them, you want to guess who wrote that one? <laughs> Pope Gregory the Great. But we have this moment here where we have different parables understanding what forgiveness should do, not just to be forgiven. We have this parallel moment also in Luke 18. As he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. That seems to be the contrast, right? The Pharisee standing by himself, praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, a man who is in no need of salvation, because after all, look at all the things that he does. I mean, this guy's just so darn good. And he's thankful for what? That he's not the other guy. Don't mistake that thankfulness for being what God made him. Rather, he's actually demonstrating what he's made himself out to be. In fact, this right here is that health, wealth, prosperity garbage, right? And, and I was about to ask, how do they preach the way they do, the health, wealth, prosperity guys, and pass over this scripture? But that would actually give them the benefit of the doubt that they actually read the scripture. I don't believe they do, because if they hit this passage, there's no way around it. We have one who's justified, one who's made right before the Lord by the Lord. The other is not. Period. It's not even saying one is more justified than the other. One is, one is not. That other, that's the Pharisee. You know that moment when there's going to be those who are going to be standing before the Lord and they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And they have this long resume of things they did. This Pharisee is one of them. I have a feeling Simon is one of them. So we get back over to this passage here and we look at what's being said. And the question that's being asked, which of the two forgiven love more? The word love here, this word is agapao. Okay? It's not uh, uh, typically, you know, you might think, oh, it must be agape. This one is agapao. Uh, and it's, it's, this word is used in a way that demonstrates receiving love, agape. It's what you do with it. That's what agapao means. What you exhibit in, through, out, and from the received love. More than just asking who will be more grateful, the question or the statement is in the gratefulness, who will demonstrate it? Who will exhibit it more? And if you notice Simon's response, what is his response? I suppose. Tell me a way to say you know, but you don't really want to say you know. Because he's setting himself up for a trap here, isn't he? In fact, most of the time, that's what the parables do with the Pharisees. It kind of puts them in a corner where they have to face themselves for a second. Well, this, the story continues. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him, now we understand there is an audience, began to say amongst themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You also notice real quick here the, the pronouns. Talks about she and then he. He doesn't say he and he and she and she, but he's identifying right away her, this woman. She's the one with the big great debt in my parable. And look at what she's done with this. He, well, there's only one he at this moment that's being addressed. That's Simon. But it says, then turning to the woman... This is a moment, this is one of those teachable moments that Jesus is going to take and he's going to help us understand something. So he starts with what this woman has done versus what Simon has done, or actually I should say what Simon hasn't done. Simon didn't offer any true form of hospitality in the whole entire process. No water for his feet, no greeting. That would be the holy kiss, right? That's something that you give your brother. That's something you give your you know, family, somebody you trust. She, however unknown woman offers this hospitality now understand a couple things simon is a pharisee he's a religious leader he's also the owner of this house so by right he would not have i want to make sure we understand something here he would not have washed jesus feet that would have been beneath his station both as a, a religious leader a pharisee and the owner of the house but at bare minimum he would have provided the guest the necessary things to do so. Chances are, since it's his house, 
there probably is a servant somewhere. So the servant might have actually administered those things, but at bare minimum, a bowl of water and a towel would have been provided. And Jesus is saying, you didn't even do that. The holy kiss, equate that with, um, uh, shall we say, the holy handshake, right? The whole purpose of the kiss, right? You, you know, it's a kiss on the cheek. The whole thing is that's something you do with somebody you trust. It's a brother, it's a family member, it's a friend. It's, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, there's a certain level of familiarity and intimacy all at once. It says, I trust you enough to get that close to you. It's kind of like the handshake, right? In the respect that um, if I didn't do that, it means I think if I got close to you, you would slip a knife between my ribs. That's why we do the handshake, right? The handshake is because um, you can't reach for your sword unless you're Ehud. Um, You know, Ehud was a left-handed man. Um, But uh, you you shake the hand because that keeps the blades safely away. And he's saying, you didn't even do that. You didn't treat me like a brother. You didn't treat me like family. You didn't even treat me like a good Jewish man. Simon's not a gracious host. And Jesus is implying that Simon, the reason he's not a gracious host is because he felt no need to be gracious at all. That's the point of the parable. In fact, if we go back to the parable for a moment, I want you to notice a phrase there, canceled the debt. That's just one word, charizomai. Charizomai uh, means to be gracious or to be free with your grace. The insinuation here is that with a freely given gracious act, one might assume it would also be returned with yet another freely given gracious act. The root to this word is charis. Charis is the word that we get grace from. So go back to agape and agapao. When you receive agape, you do something with it. You agapao it. So when you receive grace, you do something with it. You become gracious. It's the same act. It's, it's, you don't receive it and say, ah, it's mine. It enables you to do something now. The forgiveness of debt is an act of grace. And it frees people then to be gracious. This is that contrast that we might see in the parable of the unforgiving servant. You know, the guy with a lot of debt but doesn't forgive the little guy, right? He took grace, but he doesn't offer grace. The same can be said in the Luke 18 passage. The Pharisee felt he deserved, he earned his place with God, his grace. And yet he offers none to the tax collector behind him. In fact, he's just thankful, and he's actually really honestly telling God, God should be thankful that he's not that guy. But here, here we have, uh, we have Simon, and he asks Simon this question. Do you see this woman? He, he doesn't ask about the woman. He's asking the question, do you see her? Remember, she's identified as what? The unknown woman. She's not ID'd by name. And yet we see an example here where apparently Jesus knows who she is. And clearly Simon apparently knows. In fact, Simon pulls... Um, the, uh, the older brother moment out of the prodigal son here. There's a moment with the older brother and he chastises the father when the younger brother comes back. And he says, don't you know what this son of yours went out and did? Notice in that parable he says, your son, not my brother. And in that moment he's pointing out all the flaws and all the, the things that he might have done presuming quite a few of them. The question would be in that moment in that parable and when we get to it we'll examine it further but The question would be, how does the older son know these things? Well, either he's assuming or he observed. But nonetheless, at no point in time was grace ever offered to his little brother. Here, Simon is not offering grace because as far as he's concerned, she doesn't deserve it. Jesus is not asking, do you see her for what she's known for or known as? It's not an issue of whether any of those things are true or not true. Do you see her as a person, not just a sinner? By the way, the word sinner that's used here is to say somebody pursuing a life of sin. They're actively in a life of sin. We are forgiven sinners. The idea would be that we have repented. We are no longer acting that way. But still, nonetheless, it's part of our resume. The same really is offered to Simon. 
let's just give Simon the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he really is a straight and narrow guy, right? Like there really aren't any real honest big faults. He isn't hiding money and he isn't doing anything nefarious. He's just stuck up. So maybe there's not as much to forgive. But nonetheless, does Simon still need forgiveness? Does he actually need to admit he needs to be forgiven? Yes. But at this point in time, he thinks his works might lessen the need. He's worked off some of those reasons to say, I need it. This actually takes us then down a path, and this is where Simon is. It leads us to work salvation. And this passage isn't about work salvation, is it? It's about what we do with the salvation. Is, I could ask this question, is she forgiven because of her acts when we look at all the things? And it kind of implies that maybe she got forgiven because of what she's doing. But you'll notice there's a past tense and a present tense that's happening here which really starts to let us in on that she's acting out of her forgiveness, not for her forgiveness. Now, parables generally have a contrast, and this is a parable of contrast. It's what I mean by when we also talk about not a proper theology. Please also understand the word theology for a moment. Theology means the understanding of God, how he works, his attributes, not me, not how I do what I do. It's who God is. And so the pro- asking that proper theology, again, God is not just a money lender, right? That's not what he is. But he is one who freely gives. He, he, he freely gives, he freely forgives what is owed to him. Now, in that whole bigger context, Paul, Paul would rein us in just a little bit, right? And remind us, that doesn't give us license to sin so that more grace can happen. We need to understand Grace is grace. There's no more grace. It's just grace. Grace is always sufficient. Doesn't matter how much it's covering. It always manages to cover whatever it needs to cover. Both men in the parable are covered by the exact same grace. One hasn't received more grace because it's not a tarp. It's not a blanket that needs to go further. It's grace, period. And to the person who receives grace, perhaps the one who ha- it, it seemingly has more that got covered by it, perhaps they will love more. And the person who um, doesn't, doesn't. It's, it begins to give us this picture. There's an expression, a reaction to the grace. To the one who seems to be more grateful, quite frankly, it should be expected that their actions would be more exuberant, more expressive, more exaggerated, perhaps. I mean, it's that understanding when somebody can come and say, I am a wretch, who could save me? Who could love me? And we see that God does. Perhaps just as telling is one who does not live freely, graciously. And maybe they don't do so because they feel they have not received freely or graciously. Rather, it's, they see it more as earned. Because if I've earned it, I don't really have a response now. I'm just getting what I'm owed. Think about this one. Um, if you work for somebody else, meaning you're not self-employed, do you feel gracious for your paycheck? And what I mean by that is, I'm not saying, are you happy you have a job or you work for a good person or anything like that. But at the end of the day, you got your paycheck, Why? because you earned it. You put the hours in, there was a contract agreement, you get X amount for X amount. And so everything you get in your paycheck at the end of the day, honestly, is something you deserve. So you don't go around waving your paycheck saying, I'm so thankful for my employer because he paid me what he owed me. It's just, you owed me, there it is. That's it. But at the end of the day, because you were paid, because you worked and you earned it, and therefore the paycheck isn't even necessarily graciously given. Can you imagine if the employer said, you know, I really want to pay you, but I'm just not going to? Well, that might actually happen for some people, but that's not supposed to be how it works. You get what you, you did. I would ask the question, do we receive grace like we receive a paycheck? Because see, there was that one Pharisee who did. I fast. I tithe. I, I, I. So therefore, why wouldn't I get grace? Of course I get a paycheck. Why wouldn't I get a paycheck? I put in my hours. I hit the time clock, whatever. Now we take this money lender analogy and we take it further down the road. The cost of forgiveness is, well, that's on the forgiver. 
right? The, the for, I'm sorry, the cost of forgiveness on the forgiver, that's, it, it, it's the one who forgives, right? It's not the forgiven. As the forgiven, I'm receiving. It doesn't cost me anything to be forgiven. So the money lender in this picture is the one who is truly at loss. Now, back to the prodigal son story. Uh, Keller, in his book, Prodigal Son, and if you haven't read that, you need to read that. Um, but uh, in his book, Prodigal God, he points out something that's interesting, something that gets overlooked in church. Um, it's actually the meaning of the word prodigal. The word prodigal means spending freely or spending recklessly. It's all about the context. Prodigal means wastefully extravagant or it can mean giving on lavish scale. It does not mean the return of a lost person. That's what we apply it to, don't we? When we say, oh, it, you know, somebody comes through the door. Oh, it's the prodigal son. He has returned. The word prodigal has nothing to do with anything being lost and found. The story is about somebody who has been lost and found. But the prodigal, the word prodigal, depending on the character, is how they handle what they have received. In the parable, we have three different versions of what prodigal looks like. The younger brother goes out and recklessly wastes his fortune. The father, on the other hand, has actually given the younger son his inheritance before he dies. And then, even though it was wasted, when he returns, he throws him a party with a fatted calf, the robe, the ring, all of that at the father's expense. So he lavishes it on him. The older brother, in the meantime, lives exactly opposite of all of this. He has a false piety. He denies himself of the lavish love of the father, even though the father says, don't you understand all that I have is already yours? And it's to understand how we respond to what it is that we've received. And do we know what we have received? That older brother, as far as he's concerned, he's earned everything he's got. So Simon's being challenged by his own admission, or maybe it's even his own omission, because there's a lack of evidence in his life, a lack of evidence of graciousness, and it cries out for his lack of love from the one who forgives. In verse 49, this is that moment we first realize, oh, there are other people at this table. And the Pharisees ask their favorite question, who can forgive? Now, while it doesn't exclude Simon, it also says Simon didn't ask the same question. So here we have a point that Luke wants you, me, the reader, to see and to answer. So the first question would be this, who has the right to forgive at all? Well, the person who has the right to forgive is the offended. It's always the offended. They're the only one who has the authority, right? So if you do something against me, or vice versa, it's you or me that has to offer the forgiveness. Somebody can't do it for us, right? And, and that often will happen. You see it usually maybe in a, a husband-wife duo. The husband, because he's a man, says something really stupid. And then the wife, trying to smooth the water, says, oh, please forgive him, right? You know, uh, he didn't mean that. The only person who has the authority, right, is the offended, Okay, so that, now we've established that. Who has the right to forgive the offended? If this person that we're talking about, this woman, has led this life of sin that has been identified, nothing's been disputed, she is a sinner, so the offense to this particular situation, that offense goes to the giver of that life in the first place. So therefore, who's the giver of life? Even amongst the Pharisees would admit this one. Well, that would be God. So God is now the offended. So who has the authority to forgive? That's your question. God. Now, here's what Luke is asking. He's asking the reader. He's making a point that you and I can come to a conclusion. He's saying only God can forgive. But who's doing the act of forgiving in this passage? Jesus. Now the question is this, that is being asked without being asked, who is Jesus. He's God. He's not just some teacher. He's not a prophet. He's not a righteous man. He is God. He has the authority to forgive in this moment. 
because the offense that this woman's life is was at him. And he has turned around and said, you are forgiven because he can. The parable is one of understanding forgiveness and it's understanding our response to the forgiveness. It's also how we react to someone who has been forgiven. That we need to enact forgiveness and grace to the forgiven. I want to back up. This whole picture of debt, sin debt, and the forgiveness of debt as it is a whole, I want you to understand that this is not a, uh, a Jesus-only thing. Sometimes when we read the New Testament, we think everything Jesus said was brand new. It's a whole new idea. It's a new way of doing things. He came on the scene and blew everybody's mind by doing something new. And I would tell you that this entire parable has nothing new in it whatsoever. But in fact, I would even suggest that Simon knows this. Because Simon, by the way, being a Pharisee, he would have had what I'm about to read to you memorized. This comes from Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. That's a forgiveness. That this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it, out of, or exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. God's forgiveness has been proclaimed. You now extend that forgiveness. This is also known as the year of Jubilee. Of a foreigner, you may exact it. So there's an exception to the rule. But whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. You have to. It's a command. It's a law. It's one of the laws. So the idea of actually forgiving somebody of debt, a brother, uh, a neighbor out of debt, that's nothing... uh, That's nothing new. So what is new in this? Jesus teaches that forgiveness, right, not just debt, forgiveness is intended to be extended to all. See, there's another parable that we have to apply now. And and we'll talk more about that parable at another time, but there's a question that's asked. Who's my neighbor? It's to understand at that moment that Jesus has now invited the stranger the foreigner, in. Suddenly, the stranger, the foreigner, has become my neighbor. And according to this passage, my neighbor is my brother. There's a phrase I want to throw out here. It's called gatekeeping. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase. Um, Usually, it's it's generally uh, kind of included in, like, hobbies. I know, like, in some of my hobbies, there's gatekeepers um like i'm a i'm a board game guy right i love board games um and uh so you know we might be talking you know, oh hey mike you like board games yeah, yeah you play monopoly and that's when i look at you like that's not a game monopoly's not a game you know now real quick i just want to make sure you understand so I, I have a special place in my heart for monopoly even though it's a really dumb game it's a pathetic it, the rule set is horrible the the it, it, it's random there's no strategy no buying boardwalk doesn't count so But the point is, I do have a special place for it. If it wasn't for Monopoly, I wouldn't be a board game person. I'm just going to give it proper due. But what I'm saying, though, is suddenly I go, see, I get snobby about the board game, right? And I tell you what is a good game. And I start naming off some games that you've never heard of, right? And you're like, oh, you know. And I'm just like, well, if you don't know this, then you don't really play board games, right? And I I get, I close you off. I don't let you into my world. I'm gatekeeping. I would ask this question. Do we do this individually? Do we do this as a church? When somebody walks through the door, do we say, oh, no, they can't, they, no. Maybe we, should show, maybe we should ask them, do they know where they're at? You, you do know this is a church, right? You know, this is for people who, who love Jesus. You know that, right? You, you, not you. Because I would say Simon does that with this woman. In fact, We go over to to Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim. This Okay, let me back up. Um, Jesus is reading from the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he's reading this. He's not saying it, right? He is, but he's reading it. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight of the blind to set uh, at liberty those who are oppressed. That's those who are under debt. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. 
He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been filled in your hearing. And I want us to understand this is what Christ has come to do. And he demonstrates it in the life of this woman, this sinner, and this Pharisee. It's to understand the release that has been given. And it's time that we, his church, live in the graciousness of what he has done. Not what we can do. Because we can't do it until we understand he did it. We live as a people who have received. Not earned, not deserved. And what he has freed us to do. And that is to see people in the same way. In fact, I love the phrase that he asks Simon, he says, do you see this woman? He's not just saying, do you, see the, do you see this person? He's actually asking the question, do you see her or do you see her sin? In fact, right now, that's kind of a popular phrase um, amongst the, you know, we, we give it credit to the woke community. I see you, right? When somebody, it's like, I see, I don't see your circumstance. I see you. They think they've come up with a, Jesus said it first. Jesus asked it first. Do you see this woman? We need to stop looking at the needs. That sounds weird. Track with me. And start looking at the one who needs. See, we we look at it as a problem to be solved, not as a person. We need to stop thinking, I'm providing you with something. Because at the end of the day, all the resources that I have that I can possibly do that, instead of going to my spiritual debt, my spiritual creditors, right? Right? They've been freed up now so that I can serve others with those things. Uh, The Bible has a word for that. It's called fruit. Fruit is always for somebody else. And this is what Christ has done. I don't want you to miss it. Jesus' feet were washed. Simon, being a religious leader, was not required to do that. And yet later we see Jesus himself. If there's anybody who had a right to say, I don't wash feet, That's got to be Jesus. Not only is he a religious leader by just proxy, he's God. But he doesn't take that right. Instead, he lowers himself as a servant to demonstrate that we are servants. We never stop being servants because these servants would serve out of the graciousness of what has already been received. So stop and think for a moment. We are heirs with Christ. Is that a true statement? The Bible says it. So therefore, the kingdom of God is ours. So will we be like the older son in the prodigal son story and not recognize all that the father has is ours? Therefore, we won't use any of it? Will we believe that somewhere in the bigger process, I'm above it all, I I don't wash feet? Have we become jaded with our salvation, in a sense, lost the excitement of it? I mean, I remember the day. I remember it vividly. I remember coming off of that fishing dock at Tadmore. I remember walking around. Actually, I say I remember it. I remember being at the fishing dock, and then I remember being at um, my cabin and sharing it with my best friend and thanking him for bringing me here, Tadmore. And I remember going home and expressing it. Not necessarily in the best way, but expressing it. And I remember going to school that coming up year. I remember having a a conversation with one of my better friends, happened to be an atheist, is still an atheist, and still a very good friend. But I remember sharing with him, and him saying, I don't want to hear it. And me not understanding, how could you not want to hear it? It didn't stop me from constantly pestering him with it. Maybe, maybe it's because somewhere along the line in the whole graciousness, and, and I'm, I could ask, I guess, a question. I know we're way over time now, but um, I, 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 and by the way, when I ask you questions, you understand I've asked them to myself first. There's been a few times in my life where I think I've been pretty freely and graciously with all the right intent, honest right intent, and got bit in the rear for it. To the point where I go, why did I even bother? 
to the point where I do become jaded every now and then. I kind of go and I just don't think anybody gets it and I don't think I get it and I don't understand why. why. Maybe we become Charlie Brown asking if anyone knows what Christmas is all about. But too soon. That doesn't mean we're singing Christmas songs yet. I want you to understand something this morning. If you are in Christ, your debt has been canceled. There is no more accruing debt. There's no interest. It has been canceled. And yet some of us still live as if we're under the burden of it. Or worse, we live as if grace is something that needs to be maintained. Thus making grace a burden. And I want you to know this morning, grace is not a limited resource. Your life cannot contain the grace of God. It will overflow. Always. As we come to the communion table this morning, we need to understand what has been given. Do you understand that you offer nothing at the table you were invited to come and receive from the table? His body that covers our debt. His promise, his covenant to assure all things for eternity. All at his expense. All at the expense of his father who not sparing his own son. So that you may receive grace for it is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. We learn this in the scripture alone. And it is for the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you will have for us in the minutes ahead of us to demonstrate grace. Father, there will be a moment that I am confident of that there will be somebody that we will be standing in front of and we will make the decision, no grace. And you will tell us all grace. And it won't because we're so great that we will demonstrate it. It's because you are so great. Father, I pray that each day we become more in love with what it is that you have done for us so much that we cannot help but demonstrate it. And yet, Lord, I know there's just going to be a couple days, I don't know, seven a week, I suppose, and I'm going to feel like, man, I just can't. And would you please remind me that I'm right, I can't. Because you already did. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.